Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And in today's podcast, we are going to talk about our dinosaur of the day, Lesotosaurus. And we have a bunch of dinosaur news. But first, we'd like to thank today's sponsor, Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash inodino. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Before we get into the news, we want to thank our Stegosaurus patrons. This week, we'd like to thank Chris, Nicholas, Kyle and Betsy, Trent Carbajal, and Blaze Campbell. Thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate your support. It helps us keep this podcast going. And we're thinking of adding some extra levels to our Patreon soon. If you want to join our community, it's growing. Check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. Jumping right into the news, there's a new article published in Acta Geoscientica Sinica. All right. Yeah, it's a Chinese paper, and it's a new Chinese dinosaur. It's a troodontid from the early Cretaceous. We've been talking about a lot of those lately. Like all troodontids, this one's closely related to dromaeosaurids, like Velociraptor, and it has a curved claw that you'd expect to find on dromaeosaurids. Yeah. It was found in West Liaoning province, northeast of Beijing, and it's kind of in between North Korea and Mongolia, out in the boonies there. It's named Liaoning Venator Curiae. You can probably guess where Liaoning comes from since it was found in Liaoning. And Curiae. Yeah. So the genus name means Liaoning Hunter, and then the species name is after Phil Curry. And they called him out specifically for his work on small theropod dinosaurs. The closest relative to Liaoning Venator is probably Eosinopteryx, which was discovered really close by. And this find of Liaoning Venator is really a remarkably complete specimen. It has a full skull. It's interesting because it's kind of curled up into the fetal position and you can see like its tail kind of curled up behind its back and then its head is like near its knees and its arms are kind of in there too. Hmm. So it's kind of the opposite of how we usually see dinosaur finds. There's the classic dinosaur death pose where their neck is curled backwards so their head is closer to their back and then the tail is usually curved up by their head there and this is kind of the opposite. They knew what was coming. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, it's hiding in the fetal position. And it makes it almost look like it's in an embryo or something, like inside an egg, because it's curled up in that sort of shape. But they estimated it was at least four years old, so it wasn't an embryo. (laughs) (laughs) They do think that it was likely still growing a little bit, but it was probably approaching full size, so it was you know, getting to its maximum size. But even with that, it was really small. The entire specimen fits in an area that's less than 42 centimeters by 36 centimeters or about 17 by 14 inches. So it could probably curl up in your lap like a cat, Hmm. I think. I think a cat is probably a pretty good estimation for its size. Hmm. It might be a little bit smaller than a cat. I'm not really sure, but it has claws too. Watch out. I was going to say, watch out for that claw. (laughs) Just like cats. Slightly different level. But. I don't know. This guy's pretty small. so. Mm, but those big claws. Yeah. Might be a little bit bigger, I suppose. And it was out all the time because they didn't like retract into their paws. They didn't mention feathers in the paper, but it was almost certainly feathered because we find tons of its close relatives with feathers in the area. Pretty cool find. It's got some interesting pictures. And they did a nice piece of paleo art. And the paleo art's kind of funny because it sort of recreates the pose that it was found fossilized in. So it it kind of looks like it's dancing or something. It's got one leg kind of up and its head is pointed down at the ground. It's standing up. Oh, okay. I was going to say, how does it look dancing if it's in the fetal position? Yeah, but it's standing while it's doing it. (laughs) It's hard to balance. I guess, yeah. Next up is a paper published in PLOS One titled The First Specimen of Camarasaurus from Montana, the Northernmost Occurrence of the Genus. So that pretty much tells you everything that you need to know. (laughs) Yeah. Camarasaurus is previously known from New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, and South Dakota, but 
obviously not Montana. And this one was found in central Montana in the Little Snowy Mountains, which is about 140 miles east of Great Falls. And it's part of the Morrison Formation, which I think all of the Camarasaurus are from because that's the time that they were around. They found the head and neck, part of the shoulder, a couple of leg bones, and then some other bits and pieces. And they obviously had to do a lot of reconstruction on the skull and some of the other bones because when you look at the pictures of them, there's just tons of glue and little fragments. So that must have been a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. And I think they discovered it about 10 years ago. So they might have said it took two years to excavate. So that would be about eight years to put it all back together and then figure out what it was. Quite the project. Yeah. The authors say that, quote, 82% of Camarasaurus specimens are only identifiable at the genus level, end quote. And the descriptions of the different species are a little bit too vague to be useful with this specimen. So it's a Camarasaurus, but we don't know which of the four species it might be. And they ended up specifically calling for Emmanuel Shop or somebody else to do that kind of review of Camarasaurus, hmm. like he did when he brought back Brontosaurus, and kind of really dive deep into the differences between these species and whether or not we should actually consider them different enough to be their own species. Aside from it being the farthest north Camarasaurus, it's also the oldest Camarasaurus, meaning oldest individual when it died, that has been described so far, and it's approximately 30 years old. Hmm. So not super old, but, you know, like we often talk about, most dinosaurs die before they're fully grown, and that's often in their teenage years and early 20s, mid-20s. Did it live longer because it ventured further north? <laughs> it was hiding. The key. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, maybe the larger predators are farther south or something. <laughs> I don't know. They found some pathologies along the neck vertebrae. Ouch. That <laughs> basically made the vertebrae bulge more than they should. And the author said, quote, it almost certainly competed with space previously occupied by critical soft tissues like the esophagus, trachea, etc. And it would not be surprising if this structure had some effect on the animal's quality of life. While it may make an entertaining story to say that this pathology ultimately caused the demise of GPDM-220, which is the name of the specimen, there is absolutely no evidence at this time to support such a claim, end quote. So I guess they saw the writing on the wall of what people reading the article might suppose and wanted to nip it in the bud. Kind of like how it got nipped in the neck. Maybe. We I don't, don't think it got nipped. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's no evidence at this time to support such a claim. <laughs> Fine. Fine. <laughs> They also said that they didn't have a chance to do CT scans to try to determine the cause of this neck pathology yet, and they want to kind of do these CT scans because you can get a little bit of an idea of what was going on inside the bone, and that gives you a little more information. In addition to being the oldest known Camarasaurus and the farthest north Camarasaurus, it might also be the northernmost sauropod in North America. Whoop whoop. Yeah. Sauropods rule. Tyrannosaurs <laughs> drool. I think tyrannosaurs are cooler. Well, I think they did drool. Well, that could be. They did have, They might have had teeth outside their mouth, which would have made them a little drooly. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, they're not really sure how long that'll last, though, because it's not really that far north in terms of dinosaur discoveries. And we found sauropod prints farther north than that, so we'll probably find a farther north sauropod in North America sometime soon. And next, we've got an article published in Pure J titled, New Data Towards the Development of a Comprehensive Taphonomic Framework for the Late Jurassic Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry in Central Utah. Yep, this one, there are so many articles that said, the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry mystery is solved. Yeah, it's a little bit of a simplification. <laughs> Not surprisingly, it's hard to fit all the complexity of what happened into a title, but... In the title, I mentioned it has taphonomic framework, and taphonomy is the study of how things die and then kind of where their bones end up and things like that. So really, that's the big mystery with the Cleveland Loin Quarry is how did all these bones end up where they were and why are they all there? And we've talked a little bit about it before. The Natural History Museum of Utah has a really great exhibit where they actually have kind of a recreated Cleveland Loin Quarry under the plexiglass floor and then they talk about how 
there are multiple mechanisms for how all of these dinosaurs might have gotten there. And part of the reason is it's the, quote, densest deposit of Jurassic theropod dinosaurs discovered to date. And those are mostly Allosaurus, which is obviously pretty weird. Usually you find a lot more herbivores than you find carnivores in a given ecosystem because those carnivores have to eat something. And usually it's more than one <laughs> herbivore in their lifetime. So you need a few more prey than predators. So there are a few different theories for how all these dinosaurs ended up there. And they include things like the bloat and float mechanism, which is my personal favorite, just because I like it the title. Rhymes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of funny because that's where the dinosaurs die and then they fill with gases from decomposition and then float down river and mm. then settle somewhere. Nice and smelly. It's like dinosaur rafts. <laughs> oh, gosh. There's also the theory that maybe it was a predator trap, like there was an herbivore that got stuck in mud and then a predator came to try to eat it and it got stuck in mud and then another predator came to try to eat both of them and got stuck in mud and so on and so forth until you have a whole bunch of Allosaurus stuck there. There was also the theory that maybe they died from drought or poison and part of the reason that they don't think it was just like regular predation and just a particularly well-preserved site of a lot of dinosaurs is that there aren't really any gnaw marks on the bones. So if there are all these Allosaurus there, you'd expect them to be eating something, <laughs> but it didn't look like they got a chance to do that. So that's really kind of the genesis of the mystery, aside from the massive formation of Allosaurus. So what the researchers did is they did x-ray fluorescence on the sediment and they found elevated levels of barite and sulfide, but it wasn't enough to be hazardous or poisonous to dinosaurs, so they kind of took the poisoned element off the table. And interestingly, they thought maybe that elevated level of those metals might have come from decomposing dinosaurs, and that might have discouraged some of the scavenging and hmm. thus the lack of tooth marks. They also looked at abrasion on the small bone fragments, and they found that they probably weren't washed a long distance, although there was some abrasion, so possibly they got washed a short distance, or they might have been moved around during seasonal fluctuations in water level. It's a little bit unclear. And ultimately, from all of this evidence, they decided that the dinosaur carcasses probably washed into an area during a flood, and then they rotted in a small pond so that other things didn't want to eat them because it was kind of a gross mushmash of sure. ooze. And then <laughs> some of them got buried, and then a new flood would bring in more dinosaurs, and that would just kind of repeat. And the question of why so many Allosaurus were there wasn't really thoroughly answered by the paper, but they did say that, quote, Allosaurus may have been congregating seasonally in the vicinity for a number of reasons such as breeding, food, or water, end quote. So, you know, there had to be more Allosaurus there for some reason. <laughs> we don't really know what it is. They did find an egg that was potentially from an Allosaur at the site, so maybe that's an indicator that it was a breeding site, and then they just got unlucky, and a flood came through and wiped them all into this little area. So possibly mystery solved, not really sure. One step closer, at least. Yeah. They said they want to look more detail in more detail at the bones themselves, because this was mostly about the sediment and not the bones. We'll have to see what they find later. Another round of mystery solved headlines. Yeah. Maybe they narrowed it down into like two. Hmm. So, may you know, it's Will like, that exhibit at the museum in Utah have to change? Possibly. I think it. it seems like it could still potentially be a predator trap. I didn't see too much about that, unless maybe some of the geology of the type of rock doesn't look sticky enough or something. Sure. Next in the news, the Missouri Institute of Natural Science got a truckload of fossils this past weekend from a group of scientists who wrapped up a trip to Wyoming recently. So they found a bone bed of hadrosaurs, and they think the hadrosaurs were swept away in a flash flood. Speaking of how these bone beds happen. Mm-hmm. And on June 9th, the fossils were on display for a fundraiser and open house. Mark Witten, a paleo artist, broke down how artists can, quote, predict elaborate skin structures in fossil animals, end quote. And he wrote a post where he talked about how 
bone textures affect skin composition and thickness, and how details of fossil bones can give information about beaks, horns, and feathers. There's been a lot of recent work that helped paleoartists make credible restorations of extinct animals, and one aspect of this, he explained, is the fact that skin armor and epidermal projections, like horns and crests, can be identified without soft tissue preservation. And this is based on dermis that's reinforced with, quote, densely packed collagen fibers, like you see in rhinoceros, or epidermis enhancements, like dense keratin matrices and mineral and melanin components. Horns and crests and other outgrowths tend to also leave traces on the bone surface texture and And based on this, Mark talks about how Majungasaurus had deep reinforced skin tissue and armored face. He said, quote, There are surely other animals that we could discuss with these features, but I think our point is made by now. With careful observation and comparison to modern species, we can detect the presence of body profile-altering skin structures in fossil animals, and these features should be on the radar of anyone trying to restore fossil tetrapods credibly. It should be stressed how phylogenetically widespread the examples given in this post are, as if it needs saying, pterosaurs, rhinos, abelosaurs, deer, and so on are not closely related, (laughs) and yet they share basic aspects of bone texture and histology related to skin structure. The take-home here is that skin is a highly plastic, adaptable tissue that we need to be especially open-minded about reconstructing. It is naive to assume fossil animals will only have skin types common to their closest extant relatives, end quote. And that was a long one, but he really summed it up better than I could, so. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's an interesting way to look at it. We do, we have been seeing a lot of things lately about how the texture of bones kind of tells you about what kind of soft tissue might be near it and how... Things like tyrannosaurs or ceratopsians might have had like inflatable pouches or other display (laughs) structures based on what looks like more blood supply going through the bones to those areas. And speaking of dinosaur skin, there's that article that was all over the news (laughs) about tyrannosaurs and their potential scaly appearance over being feathered. And this article is like an all-star cast of paleontologists. It's got Phil Bell, Nicolas Campione, Scott Persons, Phil Curry, Pete Larson, Darren Tonka, and Bob Bakker. So you don't see Bob Bakker in a lot of papers these days, but he likes to do the controversial stuff, so it shouldn't be too surprising. <laughs> <laughs> so they published this paper in Biology Letters. Basically, what they wanted to do is test to see if Eutyrannus and D-Long and their very feathered bodies, and remember those are Tyrannosauroids, not Tyrannosaurids, but they're very early sort of on the path towards (laughs) T-Rex dinosaurs, and they were around 60 million years before T-Rex, and they wanted to see if their featheriness (laughs) could be extrapolated throughout the Tyrannosaurid family. Previously, scientists had assumed that since Eutyrannus and D-Long both had all these feathers and their ancestors to T-Rex, and generally we see that dinosaurs develop feathers and then they kind of keep the feathers because, you know, we have modern birds. Obviously, they all kept feathers. We don't have any featherless birds that I know of. Maybe there's one out there, over 10,000 species, but... (laughs) There are some birds that have scales too, so it's possible that in those animals, the feathers kind of morphed back into scales in those parts of their body, but we don't see it on kind of a whole body scale. So this all-star cast of paleontologists looked at skin impressions from the T-Rex Y-Rex, spelled W-Y-R-E-X. It's kind of a well-known specimen. And they aren't really new skin impressions. It's just the first time they've been published on. They also included skin impressions from Albertosaurus, Despletosaurus, Gorgosaurus, and Tarbosaurus in their analysis. Although that wasn't in the main part of the paper. It was just kind of used as the analysis for whether or not the family would be feathered. They didn't really describe any new skin impressions from those dinosaurs. So in the popular media... They summarize this paper as T-Rex didn't have feathers <laughs> or, you know, get rid of the fluffy T-Rex that didn't have any feathers. And in reality, it, it just shows that there were a few small patches of scales around the body of T-Rex. And aside from the tail, 
which most scientists already consider to be scaly. The largest impression is only 4 by 6 centimeters, or 1.5 by 2.4 inches, so a pretty small patch, especially on such a large animal. And from what I could tell, the impressions are from the bottom of the T-Rex, which is often depicted without feathers already. So it's not a huge change to how most of the recent depictions of T-Rex already look. I think they did mention they would need to find a lot more fossils, too. Yeah, I mean, that's really true, especially since it was such small pieces. You want to see like a smoking gun like the Euteranus, where you have like most of the body preserved and skin impressions and feathers all over the place rather than just these little piecemeal spots here and there. Mm -hmm. Although they were over a fair amount of the body. There was a little bit by the tail, some by the hips, some on the neck. So a decent sampling. But like we've talked about before, it's kind of like trying to solve a jigsaw puzzle with a thousand pieces by only having like four pieces. You know, you have to <laughs> make a best guess, but that's all you can ever do. We rarely find these great specimens, so you have to do a lot of inference. So ultimately, they reason that Tyrannosauridae, which is T-Rex and its closest relatives, are largely feather-free. And they do mention that younger individuals may have had feathers, so they might have been like downy for a while. They proposed a few hypotheses for why they might have lost feathers. They say that it was maybe in a warmer climate, but then when they looked at it, they were like, well, not really. It's pretty similar to how China was 120 million years ago, so not so much. They said maybe there was less sunlight, which I found really interesting because one of the primary reasons to have feathers in terms of thermoregulation is either as insulation, if it's cold, but also to keep the sun off, like we talked about ostriches in Australia and how they actually stay cool by this layer of feathers and it protects them in the sun. But if they were in a forest, maybe there's no drive either way because there's no sun on you to make you hot and it's not cold enough to need them for insulation. And maybe it just requires extra energy to cover this massive body in feathers and it's just not worth it to maintain that feathery body anymore. I don't know. They also said that maybe with more energy output, because T-Rex is generally considered to be a pretty quick runner, they might have generated more heat and then needed, quote, greater heat loss ability, hmm. which potentially could happen if you had less feathers. I didn't realize they were fast. I know juvenile T-Rex yeah. is faster. Yeah. Well, they, well, they have that large caudofemoralis, so I think Oh, that's true. Relative for their size, they were putting a lot of energy into their movement. Whether or not that made them actually fast or just making putting a lot of energy into their movement, it's still a lot of heat to get rid of. And then lastly, they said it's more of a correlation, but they were a larger size and feathers tend to be on smaller dinosaurs. So Euteranus kind of conflicts with that here because it overlaps with Albertosaurus in the size estimates. But it is generally true, like sauropods and ceratopsians, which are bigger, tend not to have feathers, whereas the little tiny bird-like ones tend to have feathers. So it's a correlation, but there's a little something to that. And then, like Sabrina said, they kind of end by saying, we need more fossils to really figure out exactly what's going on with T-Rex and what its skin really looked like. And they really didn't say that T-Rex didn't have feathers. They're really just saying that it's more likely that they didn't have feathers than that they were completely covered in feathers, which is, I think, a fair statement considering we have a few skin impressions without feathers. Mm -hmm. They didn't talk much about the idea of partial coverings other than to say it's possible for display, but we haven't seen it in other related dinosaurs yet. So basically the way that Saurian depicts their T-Rex is more of that partial covering for display sort of aspect. Did they know this was coming? <laughs> <laughs> well, they knew. I mean, like I said, these skin impressions aren't really new. So they knew that T-Rex skin impressions had been found on the tail. Mm -hmm. So their recreation of T-Rex doesn't have any feathers on its tail, whereas Euteranus has feathers all over the tail. Right. So they kind of took a Euteranus and then removed feathers wherever these skin impressions were known from. Whereas this group is saying, well, you should only add feathers if you know they're there. So they're starting with a basically blank canvas because we've got lots of skin impressions that are scaly and, you know, we haven't found any feathers yet. Part of it is that 
it's really hard to prove that something doesn't exist. <laughs> and there's a pretty good argument to be had with the fact that we don't really get a lot of feathers preserved in that sediment. You know, the good preservation of feathered dinosaurs comes from China and we haven't found a T-Rex from that area. So there's definitely still potential to find a T-Rex that's totally covered in feathers on its back at least. Or to find just skin impressions from a whole T-Rex that don't show any feathers. It's really hard to say at this point. And I just want to give a quick thanks to Chris from Twitter and Chris and Kevin from Facebook who shared links with us on this story. And next up, some researchers looked at a few Australian birds, speaking of ostriches, to <laughs> compare their eggs to titanosaur eggs. They didn't actually look at ostriches, though. They looked at the molly fowl, which is mostly in dry or semi-arid environments, and the Australian brush turkey, which is mostly found in wet environments. And that's important, as I'll describe in brush a moment. Brush turkey. That's interesting. Yeah, so brush turkeys. <laughs> They're both megapodes, which kind of bury their eggs. Mm. And that's something that we think titanosaurs did. So what they did is they micro CT scanned their eggs and they found that eggs buried in wet environments had nodes in air quotes <laughs> on them. Really, that just means bumps. And those nodes were possibly there to protect the egg from acid that's likely in the soil. Since it's in a wet environment, you get some things decomposing that might add acid and then could potentially eat away at the egg. So maybe these bumps helped with that. Did that help them hatch? And make the shell easier, thinner? I don't think so. But one thing it might have done is it might have helped bring water into the shell. The spaces in between the nodes might have acted as funnels, as they describe it, to concentrate water vapor. And then it got filtered through the eggshell, which includes calcium, phosphate, and sulfur, which would have helped keep out bacteria and fungus. So Good. Yeah, there's one advantage to it there. Because uh, weren't you saying in an episode how fungus was pretty deadly? It'll get you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it won't get you because we have... Because we're humans. And we have, yeah, we are warm-blooded and fungus doesn't really live at the temperature we are. Most fungus, at least. So that's good. That is good. For the dinosaur eggs. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely good. The bumps that were found on these Australian brush turkey eggs... <laughs> <laughs> match pretty well with titanosaur eggs that are from a similar kind of environment, or at least they were believed to be, and it kind of reaffirms what kind of climate those titanosaurs might have lived in. And they also found that underneath the edge, kind of the outer shell of the egg, because the eggshells are relatively thick actually, there's little pores sticking through it to get the air in. And then there's also a connection between the pores within the shell. And they found this both in those titanosaur eggs and in the modern brush turkey. And they think maybe it's because some of the pores might have gotten clogged. And then that would give it a space to kind of, you know, adjust and make its way through the shell with like different paths. So that was pretty interesting. And then they found that the molly fowl eggs in the semi-arid environments also match titanosaur eggs that are believed to be from semi-arid environments in Transylvania and Argentina. So it's pretty interesting. It kind of showed that modern birds that bury their eggs match what we think titanosaurs that bury their eggs in similar environments would look like. Good for those brush turkeys. <laughs> yeah. And molly fowl. <laughs> That's not as fun to say. <laughs> well, maybe it is. Next, a full-sized, and by that I mean 16 feet or 5 meter long, Dakota Raptor was on display at the Touchwood Shopping Center in the UK last weekend, and it was created as part of the Dinosaurs in the Wild experience, which will be in Birmingham starting June 24th. Darren Nash advised the creation of these dinosaurs, there's 13 of them, all reimagined to reflect the most up-to-date research, and they are part of a 70-minute experience where visitors see the dinosaurs and their environment, and it sounds amazing, and all of the images that I've seen, it looks gorgeous, so I think we have some listeners who've mentioned they already bought their tickets. Please tell us what you think when you go. Cool. The UK gets a lot of good dinosaur exhibits. I know. Jealous. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, the U.S. has some things, too. So Atlas Obscura wrote a post about Laurel Dinosaur Park, which is a dig site outside of Washington, D.C. It's actually in Maryland. And that has a lot of baby dinosaur fossils and dinosaur eggs. Apparently, in the 18th and 19th centuries, clay formations in the area were mined for iron. And in 1858, one iron mine, people there had found some unfamiliar objects. So Philip Thomas Tyson, a geologist, collected the items. And in 1859, they were found to be the teeth of Astrodon Johnstoni. And that's now Maryland's official state dinosaur. Astrodon was about 60 feet or 18 meters long and weighed up to 20 tons. In the 1890s, Charles Gilmore and Arthur Bivens excavated the site, and they found fossils for the Smithsonian Institution. In 1991, a family who lived nearby that area had found a six-foot-long astrodon femur, and in 2009, 41 acres of the site became Dinosaur Park. Seven and a half of those acres are now open to the public. So twice a month, on the first and third Saturday, visitors can help paleontologists dig up fossils. And everything that's found is sent to the Smithsonian for identification and storage. And if it gets put on display in the Smithsonian, they'll put the finder's name next to it. Cool. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we have some stuff. That's still a bit far for us. Yeah. That's part of the problem. The UK is a lot easier to get around than the US. <laughs> <laughs> now we're jumping over to New Zealand, sort of. There's a review <laughs> for My Pet Dinosaur. The reviews are starting to come in, and this one that I read came from a New Zealand publication, and the movie came out in select New Zealand theaters on May 27th. The movie is 97 minutes long, and James Crute on Stuff gave it three and a half stars out of five. So watching the trailer, the storyline seemed really similar to Disney's latest Peace Dragon movie, if anyone's seen that. There's a group of kids trying to protect an animal from the military. Kind of like E.T. too. Yes, which the review talks about as well. So the dinosaur looks really cute and puppy-like, except it grows really fast. It literally expands in like a second at one point in the trailer. <laughs> According to the review, it draws inspiration from Gremlins, Stand By Me, The Goonies, and Stranger Things, also kind of Pete's Dragon and and E.T. Apparently, the villains are predictable and one-dimensional, but it's overall entertaining and the effects are good. Also, I liked this quote. He ended it with, there's a positive underlying message about the power of science, end quote. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times those movies take, uh, you know, scientists are going to rip it apart and destroy it and mm -hmm. evil people and everything weaponize those dinosaurs yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's cool i'm surprised it got three and a half stars from the trailer i didn't think it was going to be that well reviewed so <laughs> well, this is one person's opinion that's true but it's promising mm -hmm. <laughs> so in our last episode we mentioned that san francisco had a silent film festival and we ended up recording before the event happened, but Garrett and I were able to make it to see the Lost World film, which was great. Yeah, it was really cool. So like we mentioned, it was during the San Francisco Silent Film Festival, and they did a demonstration of nitrate burning in oh, the beginning. Oh yeah, that was good. That was intense. <laughs> yeah, so film used to be made out of nitrate, as some of you probably know. And it's super flammable. There's that movie, what was it, Inglorious Bastards, I think, mm -hmm. showed them using it basically to like burn down a theater intentionally. And that kind of thing actually used to happen. It was really dangerous to store film because it's so flammable. But now they use safety film that doesn't burn because he also gave a demonstration of trying to burn that and it didn't burn. Did. <laughs> and he seemed much more confident doing that demonstration. He kind of... Maybe it was for effect, but he seemed a little nervous when he was doing the nitrate. And it burned up so quickly. It did. The reason he did this demonstration was because he was talking about how hard it is to find some of this old film. And he mentioned how there are like a few things that always seem to happen when you're restoring old film. One of them is that you can never find high quality film of something that's worth watching. And if <laughs> yeah. someone's like, I found this nitrate and it's in really good shape, then he's like, oh, that's too bad because it's probably <laughs> really lame. And then he said, and then the other thing is once you finally go through the trouble of restoring a movie from this like lower quality nitrate, you're going to find out that somebody had a perfect preserved copy of it just sitting on the shelf. Which is what happened with The Lost World. <laughs> exactly. So he went through a lot of effort, him and a team, I think, restoring old film reels. And they released a DVD version of The Lost World. In 2005 or so. Yeah. And then shortly after that, they discovered a better version. <laughs> well, somebody reached out to them and said, oh, 
yeah. I have these. Would you like it? Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, yes, I, I guess. <laughs> I just went through all this work of restoring it, but mm-hmm. sure. I guess kind of fortunately for him, that wasn't a complete reel. There were still some things missing. So they ended up combining multiple reels to get kind of a single best version. And I think it's quite a bit longer because the one we saw, I think, was 90 minutes. There's one on the Internet Archive that's like 70 minutes. And I think that's probably the DVD release. And since it's from 1925, I think it's out of copyright. And that's why it's on the Internet Archive. Mm -hmm. And Wikipedia. Oh, really? You can watch the movie on Wikipedia? Yeah, I found it on accident when I was trying to look up some facts. <laughs> That's funny. I guess I did see, I think Gertie is on Wikipedia too. Oh, good. We should watch that. I've watched it. I thought you watched that one. I have, but I don't remember what happens other than Gertie eats a tree. That's mostly. It mm-hmm. also like throws a rock. But anyway, back to The Lost World. <laughs> While watching it, since it's a silent film... They had a live orchestra, and then they also pumped in some jungle sounds through the speakers when they got to these jungle environments, which was kind of weird because you're like, ah. Where is that coming from? There's sound. That like, orchestra is really good at making these sound effects. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was thinking for a minute. <laughs> and I think there were even a few dinosaur sounds that they put in there. I don't remember now. Yeah, I think there were, but they might have been like recorded versions of instruments that are like vaguely animal-like. I'm not really sure how they did it because they had a pretty small orchestra there, so they might have just recorded, you know. Yeah, there's only three or four people. Yeah. They did a really good job. They did do a great job. a lot of work. Yeah. And overall, the movie was actually really good. I was surprised at how well it stood up. It had lots of really good stop motion. It was done by Willis O'Brien, like we mentioned, the same guy who did King Kong, but obviously way more dinosaurs. There wasn't anything other than dinosaurs in the stop motion. And he's from Oakland, so when his name came up on the credits, a bunch of people applauded. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was kind of fun. You don't usually see people applauding for like the special effects team on a movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was one character in blackface, so that was kind of... That wasn't great. Not great. That's probably the one thing that doesn't... I wasn't expecting it at all, so it took me... A long time to realize that that's what was happening. Yeah, because the film, you know, it's old, old film. And I think in those scenes, they they would tint the color of the film, depending on if they were inside or outside and if they were in a cave. And I think it was usually kind of a darker tint when they were showing that character. So, like, you couldn't really tell. And then you're like, oh, wait a second. That's, Mm, That's a little unpleasant. Yeah. But aside from that, all the characters seemed pretty well put together. It was... There were a few women characters in it that weren't like typical damsels in distress most of the time. So that was kind of nice. Yeah. They mostly got respect. That's cool. Yeah. The dinosaurs, I liked the stop motion animation. The It was interesting though. The brontosaurus, they basically made its neck snake-like. Oh yeah. It was all like squirmy. Like its neck, you could tell how they articulated it in the model. Like one of those little snakes that you hold by the tail and you make it like wiggle back and forth. Yeah, but except it's <laughs> attached to a giant body and tail. <laughs> yeah, the body didn't move much. It was mostly the neck and head. And then it's also snapped at... I just cut Sabrina off because she was doing things I consider spoiling and she said, it's from 1925. Yeah, I think... <laughs> The time is over. <laughs> but I mean, it's it wasn't easily available for like 50 or But now it's on Wikipedia. So. It is. So <laughs> if you're interested in watching this, you should watch it. And we'll probably do a review in a future episode. And I also then, don't think talking about what the dinosaurs did particularly spoils the movie. And then I'll let Sabrina give all these descriptions that she wants to give. <laughs> the spoiler would be telling what the people are doing. I don't know. Not what the dinosaurs are doing. We got to know our audience here. They're mostly interested in what the dinosaurs are doing. Yeah. But in terms of story-wise... <laughs> I guess. ...doesn't really affect the plot. Anyway, if you're interested in it, <laughs> give it a watch, and then we'll probably review it sometime in the future. Moving on. <laughs> CNET posted a really entertaining video that gives an answer to the question... Who would win in a fight, 10,000 chickens or 20 T-Rexes? Because, of course, we were all wondering. (laughs) I guess so. Spoiler alert. Sorry, Garrett. The chickens win. That is a spoiler. I guess this is through sheer numbers and their pluckiness. The video was made in Ultimate Epic Battle Simulator, which is a Steam game that's being developed. And it's a sandbox-style game. You can pit anything against each other, like orcs, trolls, knights, etc., But I like this dinosaur on dinosaur one. I think that's an interesting dynamic. 
That is. I hope they realize that it's technically dinosaurs against each other. <laughs> That's true. I wonder what kind of assumptions they make in that game. Because a lot of times things like that will assume they're both doing their best to like kill the other one. Right? Well, like they want to fight. In that one, the majority of the chickens don't look like they're doing anything. Okay. But the ones, they get mowed down by T-Rex and then they just keep coming. Yeah, see, I don't think that's what chickens would do. Nah, they'd probably run away. I think pretty much all the chickens would run away, and then the ones that were getting attacked would probably just die. These are angry birds, though. But, like, think about our friends that have chickens, where there were three of them in a coop, and one rat got in mm. and ate, like, one or two of the chickens. Just one. Yeah, but, I mean, if you set up this simulator with three chickens and one rat, I bet the three chickens would win. But, like, their behavior, I don't think, is really matching, you know... Um. I don't know. It's if like those really horses motivated. that were afraid of a person in a T-Rex costume. Yeah. Imagine how afraid a chicken would be of a real T-Rex. I don't know. Or would <laughs> the T-Rex be afraid that it's surrounded by so many chickens? Could be. I don't know. They might just totally ignore each other, actually. Maybe. Because if the chicken chickens is, are pretty small. It might not be worth it for the T-Rex. And then the chickens, you know, would just try to get out of its way. Yeah. <laughs> Way to take the fun out of it. <laughs> yeah, I guess the who would win in a fight, you always assume that they're actually fighting. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Well, well, let's try it again with this next video. <laughs> There's a 30-second video going around of this cute boy in China, and he's getting scared when he's surrounded by toy T-Rexes. It was filmed in Changzhou, Jiangsu province, and the boy is in front of an Isle of Toys, and there's five T-Rex toys in a half circle around him, so he's kind of trapped. And he looks intrigued for a second, but then he starts crying. I wonder how he ended up in that situation. Do you think he was playing with them and, like, lined them up around him and then got freaked out? Or do you think somebody else put them around him? Like, oh, look at all these fun toys. And they expected him to play with it, and then he was just like, oh, God, no. Could be. <laughs> or they just wanted to see his reaction, and that's why they set it up and filmed it. <laughs> that could be. They wanted him to cry. <laughs> Well, not necessarily cry, just see what he would do. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. In other game news, the Saurian pre-release is out, and it's available to everyone who paid $60 or more during their Kickstarter. We went with the $40 early access version, which is different than the pre-release version. So we're going to wait until whenever that comes out. Hopefully that'll be this month because they announced what, back in January, I think, that they were delaying from quarter one to quarter two of 2017. So quarter two ends here in a couple weeks. So hopefully they make that deadline and we get it because I want to play it. Some of the comments on Discord were pointing out a few like issues with it, which is not surprising since it's in pre-release, but a lot of people still said it was fun. So good. Something yeah. to look forward to. Yep. And the pre-release isn't like a fully functional game. It's it's like a, a pretty limited view of what the game can do. So don't feel bad if you're like us and you don't have access to it yet. <laughs> and also in game news, Neverwinter is adding dinosaurs in its new expansion, Tomb of Annihilation. Dun, dun, dun. It's a pretty good title. Neverwinter is an MMORPG, and I never played it, but I have played Neverwinter Nights, 15 to 20 years ago whenever that game was out and that was pretty fun it's kind of like diablo or one of those games where you're a character running around in dungeons and whatnot the trailer shows a really vascular t-rex hmm. it's got huge veins in its neck and it reminds me of that stewie line where he says if there's one thing women love it's a vascular man <laughs> i do not remember that line it's when Stewie is like steroids or something and oh. he's all like ripped and he's got veins bulging out. He's bragging about his veins. From Family Guy. Yeah. Mm. It was pretty funny. But that's what I was thinking with T-Rex, especially with that news where it was like it didn't necessarily have feathers. And they even mentioned that its skin might have looked a little bit like leaves with like veins in it. And, you know, maybe that's all it needed. It just needed the veins to show off for the ladies. I don't know. But <laughs> anyway... In this expansion, it sounds like you're probably going to hunt dinosaurs, not like Saurian where you get to play as them or some of the other games where you ride them and things. It's more of, sounds more like a monster sort of situation. And it comes out on July 25th. Sounds pretty fun. And last in the news, somebody submitted another 
awesome dinosaur idea to Lego Ideas. I think we've talked about one or two before. Lego Ideas is a site where people can submit their ideas and gather support. And if you get at least 10,000 supporters, your project gets reviewed by the Lego Review Board. And then they may choose to turn it into a real Lego set. So this idea is for a natural history museum collection with Triceratops, Stegosaurus, Dilophosaurus, Brachiosaurus, and Plesiosaurus skeletons and their exhibition bases. And it's pretty awesome. So far, there's over 2,000 supporters and more than 500 days left for people to vote. It needs 10,000 supporters, though, before it can get approved and possibly put in stores. Yeah, it does look pretty cool. It's interesting because most of the uh, Lego dinosaurs are about creating realistic, you know, alive dinosaurs. And this one's like a museum diorama kind of style. So they're like more like bones. Yeah. And I just want to thank Kevin who shared that link with us via Facebook. These Legos are awesome, but not often on our radar, so it's good to hear about them. True. And I wonder how much that Lego kit would cost. They always seem to be like hundreds of dollars for anything fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If you don't have hundreds of dollars to spend, you can look to our sponsor, Audible, who offers free services to new members. And oh, that's where you were going with it. <laughs> You like that segue? <laughs> So if you go to audibletrial.com slash I know dino, you get a 30 day free trial and a free book. So you could get, say, Dragon Teeth, which we're going to be reviewing on July 5th in episode 136. We highly recommend. Yes, it's a great book. Or you could get our book, What Happened to Brontosaurus, or you could get How to Build a Dinosaur, which is Jack Horner's book all about Evo Devo and creating a dinosaur out of a chicken. <laughs> It's another fun one. And there's a few other good dinosaur books on there as well, like Dinosaur 4. So if you're interested in checking out any of these books or any other books that you might be interested in, head over to audibletrial.com slash I know dino, and you can get that link from our show notes too. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Lesutosaurus, which was a request from Dinosaur4602 via YouTube. So thank you. The name means lizard from Lesotho. It's an ornithischian that lived in the Jurassic in what is now Southern Africa, specifically Lesotho. Yep. It was named by Peter Galton in 1978. There's only one valid species, Lesothosaurus diagnosticus. So it is obviously named for the country Lesotho, where it was found. And if you're not familiar with Lesotho, it's contained entirely inside South Africa. It's yes. one of the rare countries that's surrounded on all sides by the same other country. <laughs> I wonder if that feels weird to the residents. It would be kind of weird. Like, no matter which way you go, if you go to another country, you have to go through South Africa. Unless you fly directly out. I guess so. You got to go over it then, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so Lesotosaurus was originally considered to be an ornithopod, but Paul Sereno suggested it could be one of the most primitive of known ornithischians. It had some primitive anatomy, like a partially closed hole in its pelvis by a medial wall. Most dinosaurs don't have this. Lesuthosaurus has sometimes been confused with Fabrosaurus, an ornithischian from the same time and place, but it was named in 1964. But only a jawbone and three teeth have been described of Fabrosaurus, so it's hard to know this for sure. Richard Butler in 2005 said that Lesuthosaurus was a basal member of Neornithischia, which includes Pachycephalosaurus, Ceratopsians, and Ornithopods. It's also possible that it's an early Thyreophorian, which is the same group as Stegosaurs and Ankylosaurs. In 2005, Butler also named a new dinosaur, Stormbergia dangershukai, and some scientists think that it was an adult version of Lesuthosaurus, which would make them synonyms. In 2017, Baron Norman and Barrett studied the differences between the two and found that they were mostly different because of their growth. So, maybe. Lesuthosaurus was bipedal. It was about three to six feet or one to two meters long, and it had a small skull that was short and flat. Just a little guy. Yeah. It had large eye sockets and large cavities for its jaw muscles. Oh, big <laughs> eyes and a little body. Yeah. And a short, flexible neck. It also had short forelimbs compared to its hind limbs. It had five fingers in each hand, but only four were well developed. And it had long, slender legs and, again, small arms. Its hands couldn't really grasp with anything. And it had a slender tail. It was probably a fast runner. It also had a beak like structure. This beak was covered in a keratin type material. It had leaf-shaped teeth behind the beak and 12 fang-like teeth in the front of the upper jaws. Hmm. 
It couldn't chew its food, but it could slice it with its beak. It was omnivorous, probably. This is based on studies of its tooth, which they found that didn't have enough wear on it to be chewing. It probably ate small animals and soft plants. It may have been similar to a gazelle browsing low vegetation and then running off when predators approached. <laughs> and it also may have lived in groups. In 2015, scientists CT scanned Lasutosaurus skulls, which gave a much more detailed description of the skull and was used to refer more specimens to the genus. And these specimens were buried together, which is why scientists think they might have lived in groups. They found that Lasutosaurus may have grown to adult size in four years. Wow, that's quick. Mm-hmm. It's got to be able to run off when predators come. I guess so. And our fun fact of the day is that using the term chicken-sized to describe a dinosaur is pretty problematic. Oh, no. Because I was going to describe that troodontid from China that was just found as chicken-sized, because that's what I thought when I was looking at it. And then I thought, wait a second, how big is a chicken? So I started looking into it. and That's how you got into it. <laughs> yes. It's always a rabbit hole. <laughs> And it turns out chickens come in many different sizes. That's not surprising. But even the same species of chicken, in terms of domestic chickens, have changed quite a bit in the last few decades. So a study published in Poultry Science in 2017, I think this is the first time we're referencing that journal. Although technically, you might be able to refer to a lot of dinosaurs in Poultry Science <laughs> if they wanted to go that route. So they bred three sets of birds from strains in 1957, 1978, and 2005. And after 56 days, they weighed 900 grams, 1,800 grams, and 4,200 grams, respectively. That works out to two pounds, four pounds, and nine and a quarter pounds. For it's quite the difference. Yeah, and those are all full-grown individuals of the exact same species, just you know, a couple decades apart in breeding. It works out to more than a four times increase in less than 50 years. Pretty dramatic change. Like imagine if in the 50s humans weighed 100 pounds and now they all weighed over 400 pounds. Or imagine in 50 years. <laughs> yeah. If chickens weigh 40 pounds. <laughs> yeah. That would be ridiculous. And it turns out the world record chicken, Big Boy, of course, from Pennsylvania, weighed over 24 pounds, wow. which is just under 11 kilograms. And that's approaching the weight of a velociraptor. So <laughs> one specimen of velociraptor is estimated to be 15 kilograms, which is obviously pretty close to 11 kilograms. But that velociraptor is also estimated to be 1.5 meters or 5 feet long. Hmm. And that's because velociraptors and chickens are obviously built very differently. They have much longer legs. They have that long tail. They have a longer neck. So if you call something chicken-sized, it's going to be wrong either because it's probably the wrong weight or because it doesn't have that big tail sticking out. So chickens oh, are a pretty bad comparison in general. That's why you went with cat. Dinosaurs. Yeah. The tail. I think so. And also the claws. Mm. But, yeah. <laughs> So we need to look for better animals to compare birds to. When you think of like a big bird, though, that most people are familiar with, the first one you think of is chicken or maybe turkey if it's a little bit bigger. Or maybe just big bird. You think of that eight foot tall man in a yellow suit or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yellow feathers, yeah. Yep. So we'll have to come up with something else. Maybe we'll start saying like cassowary sized or something that <laughs> doesn't have crazy breeding pressures on it. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. If you want to join our community, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.